who I'm here to talk about, with SMR. And you know, I, I want a few points for you to take home about this. The first one is, as mentioned, this is an undersigned by pretty much all the hard disk drive manufacturers. So this is something that we're doing jointly as an industry. And you know, we want to consolidate the solution and get feedback from you guys so that before we march completely down the direction that we heard everyone and we come up with something that you know, everyone can use. <laughs> so, as I was just mentioning, SMR is a new recording technology, it's coming up. And one of the things that it does, and the reason why we're talking to you guys, is it has an impact on what is observed from the interface point of view in terms of performance. So the way that you do your IOs, and more specifically the random right IOs, is going to have to be modified. So people that are familiar with the storage industry know this, but sometimes when you're not that close, you don't understand that as we evolve over time, the actual underlying technology that we use for recording data or for extending the capacity or area of density keeps changing over time. So what you get to see from, from the outside is just the you know, envelope of these different curves that represent different technologies. That they come in and they become economically viable at a certain point, and then they become a better solution than the previous one, and we keep transitioning through these over time. And then when you look at it, you have this curve of, oh, next year comes out a new drive, a new drive, etc. is we're doing internally these transitions to these technologies. You didn't notice most of these because they didn't have a real impact in terms of performance or in terms of how the drive had to be used. Well, fairly recently, we went through one of these changes that did have an impact in the interface as we changed to 4K physical sectors as opposed to 512 bytes. Well, this is a transition that's going to be of that nature, except that there's a substantially larger impact on the performance and how the drive has to be used. So that's the first key point is what we're doing is one of these transitions. They happen to be one of those transitions that has an impact to the outside world in terms of performance. And the second is that as we go through these transitions, we typically don't completely replace what was done before. It's more we build on previous technologies. So as we go forward and you see SMR, we'll still be using four kilobyte physical sectors. So, you know, it's not like we forgot that and now we have SMR. We, these things tend to be cumulative. So we expect that the type of architectures and things you're going to see with SMR are going to be around for a while. So what is shingled magnetic recording? The way we record data on magnetic disks with rotating media is you have a disk and you have constant tra tracks and each track is broken down into sectors. Typically, you could read and write each one of the sectors independently. You just get your recording head onto the correct track, you know, at the right radius, and then you read or write the particular sector. With SMR, what's happening is that the element that does the recording, the size of it is bigger than the size of a track. So you can no longer record an individual track. The way that we generate the tracks is by recording a track, offsetting by less than what the right element width is, and overlapping a little bit. And what gets left behind is a set of tracks. The consequence of that is that you can no longer independently write tracks. When you write a track, you're going to damage one or more of the subsequent tracks. So now we have the discussion is, so what do we do from an interface point of view? How do we expose this to the outside world? This is an intrinsic characteristic of the recording technology. And now what we have to figure out is, what are we going to do? We're gonna, there's a few directions that we go with this. One is, we'll just do everything under the hood. We'll introduce indirection. We'll do some tricks. We'll cache stuff. We'll do it in the background for you. No one's the wiser. And that typically works in some scenarios, especially the ones that are not very sensitive to performance. Many other scenarios, 
you end up having very unpredictable performance. And then for many of those markets, you want to have a better way to negotiate with the host system how you're going to manage the intrinsic physical limitation of the recording technology. So this drive managed approach is what I said. You do everything under the hood. And then we have these two other approaches that we, were, we are discussing, and we have uh, proposals, that, so to speak, is the direction that we're marching. One is, we call it host aware. And what that means is we'll have an interface that accepts all IOs. However, if you were to send the IOs in the appropriate way, you're going to get a very predictable performance. So there are a set of rules that if you follow, things are going to be able to be laid down on the drive without problem. And basically means that if you do sequential write IOs. The restricted, it, fall, it has the same, fall, the same set of rules in place, except that here, if you don't follow the rules, we'll just abort the command. Abort meaning an error. Yeah. Send you an error in the interface. So these are two different types. And this, of course, is a new device type, because this is not backwards compatible. And a quick question is, does, do the three things also give you different densities? I mean, do you have formatting issues that, that allow you to be better or, or denser? What I'm going to say is this. If you do something that's restricted, that means that we do not have to build direction systems. We don't have to build safe space, scratch pads, etc. So the overall cost of manufacturing the solution is smaller. If you're talking about the intrinsic aerial density, then it's a little bit trickier. You can, it depends on architectures and optimizations that are internal to each manufacturer. So it's harder for us to comment on that. But, but what, what is clear is that the difference between doing something like this and something like this is that the overhead for implementing is much smaller. You don't have to have as much DRAM on the drive for having tables and et cetera. So this ends up being easier. So we'll have a, a few more details about each one of those and then what we specifically are trying to do. So first, let me go back to this and say, look, you know, a question that we sometimes get asked is, you have this solution, it's drive managed, it's going to do everything for us. Why should we care about these other things where we have to change the host system? And a lot of this is reiterating some of the things I already said. but when we're designing these SMR drives, one of the things is to break the fact that you write a track, you write the neighboring ones, and creates this dependency that goes on forever, is that you break it into zones, and you leave a little bit of space between the zones, so that you can have each zone be independent one of the other. And um, if you write sequentially within one of those zones, we can just lay it down on the media. There's no problems. We don't have any background activities that need to be done later on, etc. It also helps us with some things that we have to deal with today, that when someone is writing a track a lot and not touching the neighbors, we have to make sure that we go and check the neighbors, because if you write too much, you might bleed a little bit of feel into the neighbors. So we're always doing these background checks anyway. But if you do sequential, we get rid of all that stuff that we have in drives today. So in the end, if you're using in that way, which is you know, towards like a restricted design, you can get the lowest cost per terabyte because this, the design of the system is the simplest possible. You're not going to have all this background data movement, and then you end up having quote unquote optimal performance. And what we mean by that really is the most similar to a device today that doesn't have the, what I call the SMR constraint. OK, so what we're talking about in terms of interface now is the following. First, we divide the whole LBA space into what we call these SMR zones. And what I have depicted here, you have this dark blue wedges in between the SMR zones, and these are called the, the guard bands. Now, these are, don't really, are not really visible um, through the interface. but I put them there so you remember that the size of the zones has an impact on the overall cost as well. If you have very small zones, you have a lot of overhead for putting the distance between them. The bigger the zones, the less the overhead. But now you have this one big blob that you can only write sequentially. 
and the bigger it is, the harder it is to deal with. So there's, these are intrinsic trade-offs of the technology. So what we've been envisioning is we're going to have two types of zones defined. One we call the random write zones, and those can be implemented in a variety of ways. You can have flash caches, you can have very wide tracks, you can have all those little side caches in direction systems, etc. It doesn't matter. The important point to note is that they are more expensive for us. You have the SMR zones, and the SMR zones are ones that intrinsically you can only write sequentially. Now, associated with each one of these SMR zones, we're going to have a write pointer. And the write pointer points to the first you know, non-written uh, LBA. And then we're going to have a mechanism. There's a mechanism for reporting what the size of the zone is, the mapping, but there's also a mechanism potentially for returning to the host where the right pointer is for a particular SMR zone. And this is important in, in situations where you're sending writes and you lost power and did it get written or not? And since we have a physical constraint on the media, it's important that we, you be able, on a, from the host side, know what was the last one that got in. So when you uh, bring it back up, you can probe, know where it was, so you know what got written, and you can continue sequentially. So, so how, do you, how do you discover the topology of, of the device? I mean, so there is a, a device map. Uh, I don't know if it's um, written in the next page or this one. So we're going to have a couple of new commands. One of them is this. You just give them what the map is. And typically, it's going to be very simplistic. All the zones are going to have the same size with the potential runs at the end. And then, optionally, you may or may not have one or more random write zones in the beginning. And we're saying potentially the first and the last in, in the straw man proposal we have going right now. And of course, you know, new capabilities are being standardized in your favorite standards bodies. So th that's the overall view of how we're going to be talking to an SMR device. Now, there's two different types, as I mentioned before. The rules for writing are simple. You just write sequentially where the write pointer is. Now, it gets tricky because what does sequential mean? There's queues, there's transports, there's reordering, there's all that mess, right? As far as the device is concerned, when it comes to the device, it has to be sequential so it can lay it down. Yeah. Are there any restrictions on uh, if we're trying to do, you know, cache flush commands, actually make sure that blocks have actually been safely written into an SMR zone that interact poorly with the sequential ordering? As in, can I? you know, do a whole series of, say, FUA writes that are sequential, uh, get the atomicity guarantees that, you know, a FUA write would have, uh, and have everything still work? Or what happens if we're doing a sequential write and we have a power failure? You know, what, what, can, what can and can't we count upon? So we're not, gonna, we're not introducing any more guarantees than what exists today. Yeah, I'm the only thing that's new, <laughs> the only thing that's new and maybe neat is that you can probe, and it will give you a write pointer that indicates what, you know, what was the last thing that was actually written to the media before the power failure. Okay, all right. And you need that because now it's not just a logical thing where you can figure out. There's implications on the physics of recording, so we have to make sure that we tell you where the last one was. Okay, um, but, you, but does that mean we also get some guarantees that if block N was uh, written, block N minus 1 would have been written? So... <laughs> That's a good feedback and something to put on. We, we have not finalized things to the point of writing down these guarantees in paper. So yeah. that's, I don't know who's taking that. As, as a file system author, yeah. I would really love to know what I can count upon. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that's a, that's, that's a good point. I'm, because of the way that the physics of the recording system works, we will only have written to the media, you know, LBA in, in plus one when LBA after LBA in because it has to be done that physically. So I would want to say that you end up having that guarantee. 
but, but the, I, I'm just saying that the spec isn't out yet for me to say that it is. But it, most likely, that's what's going to happen. Well, uh, well, I think maybe the, the, the little detail is if you send all the commands down in the right order, in the right chunk size, to the cache of the drive, they may or may not all make it down. But when you retrieve the block, everything before that pointer would have been written. Right? Does that make sense? So if you do five writes, and they're all cached in, in volatile cache on the, on the target device, if you crash and you got the first two, you would find out that the first two by, by looking at the, the device pointer, but the other three might not be there, even if they've been acknowledged to the host. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, you get, that's, a, that's a good case. We, we haven't gotten to the point of specifying those details of what happens when IOs come in cache, and what we find by sequen sequential, is it when it enters the drive, or is it that when the drive writes, it has enough in cache slash queue to write it sequentially. And these are the details that we're going to be working out. I mean, there were more specific cities in the initial vendor proposals, but we coalesced into what the union is, and we're getting feedback of this type. Or what are the things that you guys think are important? We're taking note, and then we're going to try to fit as many of these things as we can into the interface standard so it works. So that's, that's a good question. We have had some debates on this. And again, it's all general purpose. The size 256 MIBs have been proposed. Mega, mega. As, uh, that was a trade-off between some people that are, asked, that are, that are more in the backup storage, big, slow, data storage, cold storage type. They say, give me gigabytes. I don't care. Just I mean, we've seen use cases that could have a single zone on the entire drive. There are so soon. Or use cases that you know, 256 meg might be an HDFS implementation to do, for example, or something in between. It's, this is what kind of feedback you want to get from you guys of what is optimal. You've got to get the mic so you can get on the camera. You're being recorded. It's not just the room. It's but the, the physical characteristics of this is you're not going to gain much additional capacity over a bigger um, zone size because uh, we have guard bands there, and it's a relative size of those guard bands to the, the actual zone size there. So we can make them a gigabyte or something, but you're going to gain less than, say, 1% additional capacity. So just, just so you have an order of magnitude today in a typical hard disk drive, let's say a three and a half inch, you're going to have one track, about, let's say, one and a half, two megabytes worth of data. A guard band might be one or two tracks, maybe in that order. So you, you can think that a guard band in, is like somewhere between two and eight megabytes varying. So it gives you an idea of how much, after you get to a gigabyte, that's already a very small number. You know, it doesn't matter. But you can see that when you're getting to 256, that's already not negligible and making it smaller it gets very tricky. So that's just something to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Yeah, just a follow up on the SML oh, side. Um, yeah. SML zone side. So are you considering the the option like a software configurable SML size after shipping the device mm. or is it physically impossible? E, at this time, it was not the intent to have it configurable from the host. It was the intent to make it discoverable by the host. I so, mean, another consideration is if people want to partition their devices for different VMs or something, um, if the zone sizes are too big, it limits your flexibility to partition yes. the device. Yes. So you're going to have SMR zone size alignment issues that are, that are going to start propping up, right? You have 4K alignment, but that's you know, not such a big deal when you get to overall zones, and it is. Uh, uh, can you say a little bit more about, about unpredictable performance? Can you, can you kind of bound that a little bit, or it's just kind of all bets are off? OK, you know? so I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I give you the overall of, how, uh, of this. And I said there's two different device types that we're talking about. 
One is that there's this set of rules, which is basically you write sequentially, with a few little things of, uh, there's a command where you can reset a zone. You basically, the pointer comes back to the beginning of it, and if you read beyond the pointer, it's all zeros. Um, and that works in both cases. You can set those. The only difference is that for the restricted type, these are absolute rules, will fail the command. And for the other, that we're talking about the host aware, will we'll complete the I.O. And what's going to happen, that's back to, to, to Eric's question, is that each device vendor is going to have some implementation of how to deal with that. So clearly, we can, if it doesn't come in order, we cannot directly write it because of the constraints of the underlying physical recording technology. So we'll have some level of indirection. We will do some caching. We will do some coalescing. We'll do all sorts of tricks. And it's very, it's very likely that the set of tricks that vendors do are going to be different because we're different vendors and we're not allowed to collaborate in implementation. Yeah, in, in In what? Oh, how? In, um, ooh. <laughs> that is very, it's going to be vendor specific. The worst case is that you're going to have to read, modify, write one of those bands. That's pathological worst case. I, I agree with him. It's going to be that or better. Yeah, but that, that's, that's pathological <laughs> yeah. worst case. Typically, it's going to be better. We're going to aggregate many writes into one of those big read, modify, write operations. But uh, yes, what, that's the bound. Certainly, that's, that's a case that you wouldn't expect to encounter, but it's plausible. Well, for instance, you could try and edit using a second uh, variation to go to a second. Well, yeah, even, even to realize <laughs> even on today's drives, we have unpredictable performance right. uh, in the sense that queuing, error recovery, et cetera, and we have age limits on our queues. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, that unlikely to, to push a drive, a conventional drive today, and hit our age limits, which are uh, on the order of one, two, three seconds in our queues today. So it can happen today. This, <laughs> this makes it uh, more variability, variability over and above that. Uh, and, it's, and it's bounded, it, well, some of it's going to be based upon the ingest rate of the drive, right? If the ingest rate is relatively low to these things that are unexpected, we can, we can mask them. But if, they're, if they push up to the capability of the drive to actually fulfill this I.O., meaning, uh, you know, it's constantly having to, to take these bands and, 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 and do all the coalescing and write caching and, and, and get, them write, uh, get them written down on the media. Uh, it only have so many IO capability, IOPS capability. And that's, that's going to be vendor specific. It depends on how much internal caching the drive uses and everything else. But, you know, in some implementations, it could be as low as, you know, a few IOPS. So queuing and error handling is a very good keyword. So the one thing I'm wondering is, will the SMR drives give us implicitly ordered queues? Because it seems like any sort of reordering is, well, at least inside the write area, is really going to, well, really not going to be possible with the physical process. And B, the error handling, say, the first queued command gets aborted for some reason, whatever it is, what happens to the subsequent IOs, which then probably aren't physically possible anymore. Yes, yes, uh, the, the, very good point. We, we have done some level of discussion on what happens, and, and command ordering, uh, as you can see, is going to be very important here. And in many situations, ordering, we understand that ordering is not always guaranteed in the transports on the way to the drive. So it might make it very hard for someone to try to follow the rule of sequential rights when they're using transport mechanisms that don't ensure the sequentiality of the IOs. So it's something we're going to have to work on and figure out how we deal with it. it so uh, let me see what else I have. So assuming, assuming we, we optimize uh, some layer, either the file system or some layer, writes, writes this in your zones, um, isn't that more optimized for writing than for reading? Because there's no guarantee that when we read it more frequently than we write it, that we write it in the order that you don't minimize seeks. I, I, I'm having difficulty hearing. Uh, 
I think the question is, so if we're optimizing for sequential writes, like we saw that with the DM thin thing this yes, morning, right? Yes, so yes, if yes. we do optimize for sequential writes, if you're sequentializing, serializing writes from multiple threads into a sequential pattern on the reads, you might have a read performance hit, right? Because that's, that's more fragmentation on disk. Yeah. Is, that, is that your question? Yeah. So, you, so you, I think so, you have to do it by band, right? Well, yeah, so, so there's the, what you're saying is that the, the, you're interleaving three streams that are each one sequential, and you're sending that to the device. For instance. Like that the kernel doesn't even know how the user space is going to read it back afterwards. Yeah? We just write it how you submit it, and then somebody reads it back, and we don't know which order they're going to read it. So, um, but, but I mean, it's... Yeah, for, for different files. But I was just wondering, I mean, it's, uh, could, it's could it be that if you optimize for this, that you lose a lot of read performance in the worst case? Probably, right? Yeah. That we, that, that we that lose, you lose a lot of, you get more seeking for the read case. A lot oh, more seeking. you know, what you're saying is that, well, I would put each one of the files in a different one of these zones so that each one could be sequentially in parallel, but now I'm going to be seeking back and forth between yeah, them as opposed example, to serializing. Yeah. But, but you can't even seek inside the zones, right? You, you can't read any order in the zone, right? So there's no... No, so, so there's... Again, the, each one of these zones is independent of the other because of the guard band between them. Within a zone, you can only write sequentially, and then but, you have a write pointer, right? But you can read any. But you can read any order. You right? can read any order. So, so, so if I optimize for the writes, I might have really slow reads afterwards, right? Because it's a different order. Well, keep in mind you have hundreds or thousands of bands, which you need to be allocated to sequentially, and you can lay out files. Now, you know, in the number of the number of these SMR zones again is something that's kind of open in the air. There is this placeholder 256 megabyte kind of compromised generic use, but you can see some some applications will be much bigger, right? So it all depends on what you're doing. I think w when you have multiple users in different in a, in a structure, you might be using a smaller one, but that for you might look like kind of big. So, kind of, kind of a silly question. Um, uh, if you use a volume manager, uh, do you have to burn a, the, the whole first zone if you're going to label your disk? How do you, how do you handle that? So, so that's where, where we've, we've had this discussion of optionally having these first zone and potentially last zone that is, as part of the, the you know, straw man proposal be random write type zones. And the idea is that they wouldn't be very big there be something smaller, but is where you can put some sort of metadata if, you, if you're doing things like that. So, so George, at, at the risk of, of yeah. raining on your, this is hard parade, um, the, the key um, intuition here right, is that, that the, the devices, there, there's a little bit more complexity, or you have to be more careful when you write them, and you want to write large objects, but reads, in general, work the way they always have. So if, if, you, if you lay down random, um, yes. Objects, as long as you group them together on writes, you can do random reads just as high in IOPS as you can today. Sequential writes are the, the big thing that's affected, right? Yes, yes. So, the, yeah, you, you, could, you could mess it up still, but, but it's not inherently doing The reads are no the different. Read. The, the, what's happening is that you, the difficulty of scaling the write head is that you, you can't generate enough field, so you can't make it smaller. But we're still able to make the read head smaller, so it can read any of the tracks that was laid down in any order, just like today. So the reading part is unchanged on the underlying physical recording technology. It's just the writing part that has this constraint tagged onto it. So from the interface point of view, we can pass that on, and all your read IOs are gonna be the same, but within one of those zones, you just have to write sequentially. Because the reason that this, this somewhat matches you know, a lot of workloads is that there's a lot of large objects that are not written, or certainly not written randomly, right? And, and so, so this kind of technologically matches a lot of the use cases, right? Objects right. become larger, um, objects are not written randomly, and so you spend a little bit more effort to, to lay them down properly, but then you can, you can read them at, um, at random and, you know, and get some additional capacity out of it. You do it right. Well, 
it, and so that's why they're here talking about software interfaces to these things, right? <laughs> that's why I'm saying, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to underplay, you know, how, how much effort it takes to, you know, to it, be it, more careful with writes. It, yeah, there's, there's you, some you're effort right. There, you're you're going to allocate two or three files and you want to put it on the same zone, what do you do? It's, yeah, I don't know. Six or so, um, so that you that you would get even larger writes. So you know, um, basically, you would like to do a 256 megabyte I/O request. I think right now you cannot in Linux. I think you can 32 or 60, 64 megabytes at with, one I/O. With with SATA, right? You're saying? I think it's max sectors kilobytes. That's uh, um, just a best parameter. I, I have not checked where the limit mm. comes from, but there's a generic limit. It's either 32 megabytes or 64. Yeah, but yeah. In for, general, for say, I don't know what the SCSI limit is. Do you guys know? 30, but what are you, what are you saying the limit is in SCSI? Okay. Right. It's yeah. block layer. <laughs> but with SATA, you get that. It's, it's not SCSI. I think it's block layer. And Scuzzy, you no, 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 he would like to, that's what he's saying, to get rid of the problem. 100 megabytes, right? So, and Scuzzy, yes. what's the limit of the block layer for submitting big I.O.? So, um, uh, 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 there are limitations on how big a single command can be no, on the uh, interface. The question is, do you plan to use, or is it planned that these disk outs are used in a software rate or in a hardware rate? So, because if you want to write 256 megabytes in one request, you need to, to multiply this and unless you want to do um, read, modify, writes to, to, to a single, uh, so to, to a stripe, you know, in, in, a, in a rate, you, you, need, you should write a, run, um, a full stripe. Yes, yes. So, so you want to write basically. Yes, yeah, so what you're saying is that I'm going to have, you know, a number of these, and then you're striping from this one, this one, this one, et cetera, right? And then you're saying, well, if each one of these is 256 megabytes, and now I have this stripe, now I basically have a block that's the multiple of the two that I have to do read, modify, write on, and now you know, it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, but you don't, have, you don't have to write 256 megabytes at a time. You can write four kilobytes at a time. No, but what he's saying is that the, the, the shingle region has, the SMR zone has the restriction. So after he's done writing, he wants to modify one in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Rate strength by itself be itself set up this. It can still be, but what he's saying is that he's modifying... Uh, uh, 64K of okay, one of the stripes right. that's in the middle of one yeah. of the SMR zones, but the SMR zone can only be rewritten as a whole. Well, the tip method don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so aligning, aligning this, aligning the stripe of your RAID so that you're writing full RAID stripes, which are each across full minimal I.O. sizes at least, or multiple I.O. sizes, is, is always good for RAID, even today, right? It, it, it is good. good today. I think his but point is that this is kind of a little bit bigger than then what really people huge, typically use. Huge I.O.s. Yes. And you need to collect them together. That, that will be a real problem. So we, I, I know, I know that, that um, I, um, so for, for our project and the project in the past, it was already good to, to write 32 megabyte I.O.s. But now we are, we are getting <laughs> Yes, and if you have if you have four plus one parity, now you're saying it's a gigabyte that I need of data before I can write assume, down one. Let's assume we are doing a hardware rate with, with, with this. Did you contact the hardware rate vendors so LSI also because they don't allow you to, to write a single yeah. well single request is more than 250. So something. so part of part of the answer is the the physical rights at the SCSI layer don't have to be reflected by logical rights at the application layer. You can aggregate data and serialize data in device mapper. You can do it in file systems. You can, right. There's te techniques we do already. I know, to but things. you cannot send it um, if you if we take a plain hardware LSI rate. So, so the well, LSI system. would have to change its firmware, right? We are fighting this is for years. N you no, know, it is, uh, and and what you're saying is that if we. If we're using something like this, which is the restricted flavor, where we will abort the command if you're doing out of order, then you're only left with the, with the choice of rewriting the whole uh, zone, which is probably not what you would use in, in this RAID scenario. If you're using the more host-aware approach, and you are really writing sequentially, on occasion you do an update, then in that case, the drive will take care of that for you. It'll just use some form of indirection internally and eventually put it in place. And then once it eventually puts it in place, then you'll have, from a read point of view, the same as usual. And if you're doing that because you had the failure and you're updating some of these things, these are supposed to be rare events, right? And I mean, the point is you don't have to 
right at all, you just have to erase it. And as far as I understood the earlier yeah. proposals, you have the equivalent of a trim command to actually do these erases and just you know, start from scratch, right? Right. We were, you know, some early proposals have things like piggybacking a trim, but... Um, at this point, we'll just need a little support in the Faustin layer that says never reuse space in a region until the whole region can be erased. Right. Or copied out. Right, right. So something, yes, something like that. If you want to do a traditional raid onto it, it will be really painful, but it will probably be painful for various other reasons, and you really shouldn't do it. So, and, and by the way, that's one of the things we had this discussion of using piggyback on the trim a map command to reclaim one of the SMR zones, or we can come with a new command. That's also something that, you know, what's preferred? It's, it's a somewhat different use, but. It's just, I... Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you guys work on this, but I, I think reusing trim on map is, is better because we typically batch our unmaps anyway through FS trim is how most people use Linux trim. They have to be aligned, yeah. So one of the discussions is that it becomes a nightmare internally if you're saying, well, I'm going to trim from here to here, and then two weeks later you trim this other little piece and I'll expect that I'm going to keep track of that. But, but what I what might work, right? So what we would do is either send you down trims. So the, the trim command today can discover some of the device information, the file system information, and send down batch trims. Yes. So you could either ignore the, you know, the, the unaligned on multiples right. of, a, of a band and the ending, or you could just, you know, well, we could try to modify the command to, to be device aware. In, right? in, in this case, ignoring anything seems like a receipt for disaster because any trim will just, I mean, let's just assume your previous example. We have a trim that is right. like straddling two of the areas and right. not actually covering one of them full, which means there's nothing freed on the disk that gets reusable. And at the same time, the file system does its bookkeeping and says um, we can actually do something with it again. So this will not actually work. So uh, again, uh, yes, it, it's, 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 it gets tricky because in the, scenario where we're saying that it's the host aware where the drive will do something to assist will you when you do random IOs we'll be having to keep track of all that and then try to and that's the situation where we get those um, tricky performance characteristics where you start having these little holes all there and we're having to deal with them so so one question is with regard to rewriting the data that would have this you know negative impact yeah. Are you able to, if you decided you want to rewrite within a zone, can you pick any arbitrary point and no. as long as you keep writing, no. you won't disturb any earlier data or do you have to rewrite the whole zone the whole from zone. the beginning? The whole zone. Uh, so this is something that we had a lot of internal discussions on and we understood that just going back a little bit might be of, of use. The problem is that, as I alluded to before, of the the benefits of sequential writing is when you write a track, you actually just perturb the one before a little bit. And this is like adjacent track interference or adjacent track erasure, just because it's so small and magnetic fields are very hard to collimate. They tend to spread out. So you damage a little bit the other one. So it's a reliability issue. So we don't like to write the same track twice without re rewriting the previous one. So that's something that's already an issue today in RISE, even before we go to SMR, as we're making smaller and smaller, we internally have to be careful about that and keep counters as to how many times these things are happening and refresh the one that's neighboring when one gets the, the number of writes of this one and this one get too out of whack. So we have to rewrite a, it's this It's not one. a good technique in to, to have a hot spotted 4K sector that you write over and over and over and over again. Without no, questions. no, yeah, yeah. None of them do that, yeah. <laughs> But, I, but that's not usually a big problem because I assume that you, there's layers of caching no, above that. Some, it, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, it should. I mean, that's what caching is supposed to solve, right? I mean, technically, we can, we can work to solve it. Yeah. Right. And traditionally, the super block just gets hammered all the time. But um, going back to the trim, so in compatibility mode and host aware mode, it seems a no-brainer that you support trim for 4K blocks or whatever your right. native mapping is. Right. Um, it's the restricted mode where there's a new kind of trim probably for 
big things. It might or might, or might not, you see, that, and that's another question. The way that we had envisioned this is we would have the exact same command set for the two modes. The only difference is that restricted, if you don't write sequentially, will abort the command. So that from the interface point of view, the commands are the same. You don't like it? It seems fundamentally not to make sense. I mean, you don't want to allow me to do these things which you can't reasonably support. Right? Oh, you mean trimming smaller Yeah, you know, if I do portions. a 4K trim, what the heck does that mean in restricted mode? Well, and I mean, I mean, the other argument is it's actually doing something different than trim. I mean, a trim it has essentially is an internal optimization. The only external effect is that it might zero the blocks if the device has that specific configuration. But I mean, for most things, it's like just tell the device it's gone, let it optimize. In this case, the let's call it erase means we can't actually reuse that space before we have issued the erase. So it's a or very fundamentally different. Or equation. you, I mean, the other thing you could do, Christoph, is you could issue a, tr a trim or erase, whatever. I would say trim you'd have to go back and revalidate that the pointers had been reset using that new interface, right? If it's a... No, but there's, but there's another case, right? Yeah. That's a yeah. Say, say I was buying into... Say, just say, I'm going to buy into their unpredictable performance thing. <laughs> then trim is suddenly very useful, right? Because then if, if Mark's going to get all crazy about read, modify, write, then if he's got the trim, then, then he doesn't have to read, modify, the, write this data that... I knew I wasn't, I wasn't interested in, right? So that's, yes. that's actually very important. Cause you, it is very I, important. I think you and guys made this unpredictable sound so horrible to get people to not use it, but if you made it a little bit better, maybe we'd use it, and then we'd want this we, information. Right? All of us are going to work very hard to make it the variance as small as possible. And it's, you know. However, we're just you know, being honest that there is going to be less predictability. But, but, trim would, but trim would help that, right? It does so, help, So yes. if you knew that most help. of this region I had already given the up on years The more information I, I have, the less bookkeeping I have to do. I don't want to be do bookkeeping on data that you know you're not using. Right. Right? And it, that is true. And that's why we, we've been back and forth on using just the trim or not, as it seems to be a little bit different. You continue to use trim, I think is your point, for the small blocks and just have a command that resets the whole zone. And then that, and that, that way you don't have to check back again anyway because you sent the command to reset, so it's reset. So it, 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 we're not dead set one way or the other. This is part of the feedback process. So if you were talking about a non-restricted mode, and in the non-restricted mode, what kind of space overhead are we looking at? What do you mean space overhead? So presumably in order to <laughs> little implement in direction. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, again, that's, so this, that's the, the host aware mode, right? Uh, I don't think there's any specific piece of information here, <laughs> but the it's vendor dependent, so that's something that's not going to be standardized. I think each one of us has their own designs, and we get into trouble if we start talking about them. So, out of these three different modes, do you think you support uh, a larger subset than just one at any given time on a drive? Will I be able to switch? from one to the other? Oh. Uh, and if you say so, no, what do the other OS vendors say that they like? So here's what's likely to happen. If you, if you think about it, I talked about drive managed. And what we're calling about drive managed is the, the type of things that we are putting in the market today. I mean, I can say, I can speak freely about Seagate's one million SMR ship drives because they made a press announcement about it. So that, what happens is that we're incorporating technology and we just don't tell you. There's nothing in their face. Someone might be using it and say, whoa, what's happening here? Hey, manufacturer, what's happening? But that's, that's what we call, and that's the first type. When we go to the host aware, it's usually, I mean, that's a vendor decision, but most likely a vendor would use the same implementation that they were using for the drive managed, just put in an extra few commands that lets the host help lay down the data in a way that becomes more predictable. So you really only have two, two solutions. The other one is before there's any standards work done or negotiation with the, the system. So, I don't know why I started talking about it. You had a question? <laughs> Dynamic change. No, oh, so back, so back to the point. So the, the point is, you can essentially get it restricted from the host aware by just following the rules. It will behave the same. However, the whole benefit of implementing the restricted is that 
we don't have to put as much memory on it. We can, don't have to support a lot of firmware that does all the different variability of things that can happen. So it's, it's the, the fact that there's a lot less firmware and maintenance for that and resources on the device that makes it a more cost-effective solution. So, it's, so you're probably going to have these two categories because of that. And you will not have drives that can be switched from one mode to the other? Maybe? We have not envisioned this, but I do not see... I, I can see where a manufacturer might put a flag on the host aware that says, oh, I'll start aborting the commands if they're not sequential. It, there's, no, there's no advantage for you. It's going to be because it has the same cost as the one that accepts all IOs, but you might be able to put it in that mode. I can see something like that happening. We haven't discussed... We, in, we discussed very briefly this in, 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 in committee, and we, saw, we didn't think that there was going to be one, but if there's a big demand for something like that, it's just that there's no economic advantage. There's, it might be interesting for um, debug development work. Well, I mean, it seems like a natural progression. You start out with the, the completely hidden, and then you have host aware, and then, I mean, would you envision at some point once all the software on the earth has been changed to, to handle it, then flipping on the restricted and then... Restricted forever? Well, that's... Is that kind of 10 years from now or whatever? I, you know, I... Hard to say. I can't see that far in the future. What we had in mind when we went down this path is we were looking at, and then we've discussed all of the companies with particular customer sets and individually, right? And then we bring that into committee. But what we envision is that there are some use cases for the very low cost, very low I.O. density, not general purpose storage, like cold storage, archival, in that area where this restricted mode would be interest. And that's where we're going to cost out as much as we can from the device. We don't have to have all the, all the you know, DRAM is the most obvious one, but there's a lot of other things that we do that we can cost it all out and get the lowest cost drive. It's going to be very low performance. It's restricted. It only does this one thing. But if I'm doing mostly archival and some of these things, I can incorporate this in my design. So, so uh, it, now, if this is going to be the only drive that's going to exist 10 years from now, I don't know. I mean, everyone says how drives are becoming more and more like tape, so... <laughs> So my, my theory is... But I, it, it's, it's less obvious that it will be in, in, in client machines or in more general purpose environments because of all the difficulties that you know, a lot of people have already pointed out. So, but we'll see how we evolve. It depends on how the, 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 the system evolves. My theory is that, like, like for lots of uh, consumer equipment, you'll pay more for the professional device, which does less. <laughs> but, but, it, you, but you can squeeze it to greater lengths, right? So just having better performance uh, predictability is worth a lot to some people. Yes, we, we say that the predictability is what you get, and you get the better cost, but you, you pay the price of the restriction in how you do your right IOs. Never tell vendors that they can charge you more money for giving you less. <laughs> that, that one he took out three times. <laughs> Well, people nope. can always misuse. So just a, a time check. We have 15 minutes until the tea break. So I actually, we, we had jotted down a bunch of questions that we wanted. But you guys have been asking and seeing so much Let's stuff. I almost touch any questions. We can also, I'm, I'm interested. We have Ted in the back, XFS developers, Ben, who maintains XFS. Um, don't have device mapper people. But I think it's worth talking about how we would do this. So, so here's a, a couple of questions. So you know, the first one is, if you had to choose between these two modes, do you like, do you like it to take the command if it, the I.O., the right I.O. didn't come in order and us do something in the background, or is it better just to fail the I.O.? I think, actually, I think if you fail I.O.s, you probably make the file system go read-only typically, right? If we propagate it up the stack, typically you get, unless we hide it with multipath or something, right? Typically the I.O.s propagate all the way up to the file system, which... <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the, the assumption is anyway, if we, I mean, this essentially boils down to being in a restricted mode, which means we have to be speci specially crafted file systems and whatever. Yes. And at that point, it is an error, and it will just have its own sense key, and we can deal with that. Right. So, I mean, 
uh, I don't quite understand the question. I mean, if it's if it's supposed to support un the non-matching ones, it should not throw an error. If it's a restricted configuration, it should throw these. No, no, it is. I think the 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 what's behind this question is more back to his his question before, which is, do you guys see only restricted type drives existing, or do you see these two type of devices existing? And I think the question is more along the way the lines of. If we only had restricted, how much pain would it be for it to be supported? <laughs> Meaning you'd rather that we do something in the background, do the best it can, hide it so it's not too painful, but keep the capability. Yeah, I mean, one more distinction between. We made a DM zone layer thingy that remapped all our random writes into advancing zone writes, uh, and then we scramble all the read locality. If we were to go back and defrag, we have to get it all the way off the platter and mess about, right? You guys can defrag a lot better than we ever could, right? And, Somebody, and then, somebody's going to be doing a log somewhere, and having mm, it down on the firmware has some arguments, because we don't have to pull it up. I, I, even if we only pull right. it up to DM, we're still going to do a crummy job in a lot of ways. If we pull it up into each file system, it's even worse, right? Right. And you're saying we can do it all under the hoods inside the little yeah, yeah, yeah. You processor know, on yeah. the drive over there, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, so picturing in my head, we have kernel threads that are reading and writing, and it's Butterfest all over again, and just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, from a practical perspective, uh, I think it's easier to create a drive that, you know, maybe has a little bit of flash um, that you could use to actually hide some of the GC activity um, where you store the metadata, whereas if we had to do it uh, in the file system and we had to be constantly updating the log in the you know random read write random section of the disk, uh, I think it would be a lot slower. Now I could imagine some really weird device where the ran the read write random section is actually flash, so that we actually get the performance we need, and then we're doing it in the OS versus the drive. Um, you know, I think that's actually going to be the issue. Is is that if you guys are willing to do something where it's actually sort of a hybrid device that has a little bit of flash in it. Um, and that, of course, that raises the price, right? Right. Um, so, if it's cheap, I think what will happen is at least initially, um, people will probably only use it for backups because there won't be any software available. Over time, we might try to create a DM zone that would allow us to use a really, really cheap device um, in slightly more effective ways. I think it's really hard for us to answer this particular question without knowing what the parameters are about price and performance. Mm. Because, you know, and, and I know we can't go there, but yeah. that's also why it's really hard for us to answer that question. Because if it was super, super, super cheap, I can imagine people saying, yeah, we'll move heaven and earth in software to actually make something really clever. But if it's only going to save five bucks, we'll just say, eh. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, five bucks is a lot of money. What are you talking about? Now, uh, 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 so, so one point, you, you were saying about having Flash or something like that. So if you look at the way that we have this um, parsed out here, we just described that we would have, um, whoops, wrong direction. We have these, what we call the first or, or potentially last zone as well, which would be random write. That can be Flash or it could be just on the physical device itself, but it's something that has the capability of random IOs, I mean, random write IOs. So um, I have three uh, concerns. They're sort of questions, but I'm going to raise them as concerns. So sure. We can batch them. Um, I have others, but these are my top three. The first concern is lights out behavior. On a modern current disk, right now, when I turn out the lights, you will give me a right splice. Um, that's fine and dandy if the only thing you're right splicing is a sector. It's not so fine and dandy if you are also right splicing some other unpredictable piece of data. Um, and the extent to which I have to go and log other pieces of data means that maybe I have to go and take a, two, a few more revolutions of reads and then log them somewhere to a device that's not an SMR device because I can't trust that either. And I'm concerned about the lights out behavior. So ju just this, so I understand, when you're saying is that when you send a write I.O. and it has more data than a single sector that we would no, have? No, no, right now. You're, you're talking about background activity? Right now, if, let's say I have a 4K block on a 4K native drive. Right. 
um, or if you prefer a 512-byte block on a 512-byte native drive. Yes. It doesn't matter. Um, when I go and write that sector, if I then turn out the lights yes. during the middle of that write, I am not going to end up with necessarily the old sector or the new sector. I am going to end up with junk in All that right. sector. So far, so good. So now I'm on an SMR drive, and, when, and as you've pointed out, writes are destructive of regions of the disk that have nothing to do with the data that I'm writing from a logical perspective. Physically, it's, a, it's very clear what's being destroyed, but logically not. So now I turn off the lights during the middle of this sector, and I have destroyed some unrelated piece of data, which means that as a software person, whether it's a file, whether it's, it's someone who's writing a file system or someone doing something else, that other sector, I, I now need to account for the possibility of destroying that. Effectively, it's congratulations. Um, uh, I have so, a RAID 6 write hole without RAID 6. But it, it, I don't think anything like that happens. What we're saying is that you're coming around writing like this, right? And if you're writing like this and you stop writing here, all this data is beyond your write pointer. Yeah, but so that's not valid data. But right now, you're in the middle of a sector. Let's yeah. say right now, right now on a modern drive, let's go right back. I'm yeah. I, write, I write sector three yes. on my drive yes. right now. And if during the middle of that write, I turn off the lights. Yes. When I read sector three back, I am going to get a media error. Right. OK. So now, on a new SMR drive, when I write sector three, yeah, I am this. also affecting sector 13, say. So far, so good? Sector 13 is not valid when you're writing three. It, you cannot write three while 13 is valid. Yeah, but I'm not, I don't want to write. I can't write it while it's valid at all. Yeah. Now, if you're in the. So, you're, so, you're writing, so that will not happen. I, I, I can explain this maybe a little bit better, the concern you're worried about. Today, there exists crappy SSDs where <laughs> when you power down a device while you're in the middle of a write, a write, uh, a sector that was written previously, possibly an hour ago, can vanish when the lights go out because as a part of the background GC operations, it's copying erase blocks and it loses data, possibly data that had been written after yeah, yeah. cache flush to command. Now, arguably, that's a buggy FTL. Yes. And I think your concern is that we might have that situation where you know the, the log is going on, the disk actually ends up destroying previously written data on a power failure. Is that a fair assumption of your worry? That's one of them. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that is different, right? And that's, and that's the background part. That's why I was asking if it was about background. If it's about background tasks, Again, it's just implementation, right? If you implement, implement it correctly, you shouldn't be in any, in any way that you're exposed to a, to a power failure. And so, I, so, but, so going to go into the simple case then, um, what you're saying is if I go and I take the zone and I write it sequentially, right. and then I turn the power off during the middle, I am not going to lose any previously written data. You're going to be, no. You're going to be in the same situation as you are today, the last sector that you're in the middle of writing, with the only difference is that when it comes back up and you ask for the write pointer, it's going to tell you either at the end if completed that sector or right before it if it didn't complete that sector. Okay. Um, so, um, so that's, that's it's even better, yeah. That's you just can. That's actually I know. Better. We're improving um, things. So, so far, so good. Um, number two. Um, so, it's, it's fine and good. We go back to 1988 and we have now geometry aware drives again. And maybe yeah. the device driver knows about it, and the file system knows about it, and we've formatted it, and we've written code, and we've done everything. Um, whether it's a file system, whether it's some other application that's just writing the disk raw. Yeah. And now, in six months, each of you comes out with a new drive model with new geometries. And um, it would really suck to have to rewrite a line of code. It, 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 I agree. Um, so one thing to here's the table. It is, it is. It's One of the things that we had discussed in, in some of the proposals, I mean, we washed out the details, was to try to restrict the sizes to be just powers of two. So you can get an older that has a finer granularity. You get two of those, and then the one that has a bigger, and then the two guy, you know, and kind of make it somewhat compatible. But this is a parameter that you're going to read from the disk. You're not going to hard code it, right? So you're going to have to probe the disk for what the parameter size is and deal with it at some layer. That's the. We, you know, it's fine to go and probe or have tables or something like that. But to have to go and reorganize and re-optimize code, you know, for different you know, sizes, it doesn't, it doesn't start. You know, to rewrite code that, which means I, that the code, by the time the code is written, the drive is obsolete. Um, but so last one is very quick, 
and that is I notice that you have a random zone at the beginning of the drive and at the end of the drive, which means it's very painful to partition a drive because any partition in the middle won't have any random zones. Um, and it would be nice to be able to actually format a drive so that we can sort of dynamically okay. specify okay. this way people who want it have it, et cetera. So here's, here's one question that, oh, sorry. I <laughs> Uh, here's one question. What would you? We have to do something, right? Some some bookkeeping. Would you prefer that the bookkeeping be done up front in the when the write comes in, or we stage the write and do the bookkeeping asynchronously in the background? You're you're going you're doing a write that's not sequential. So now we're going to have to stage it somewhere. And then now we might do some fixes so that we can put it in place. Like we do a remodifier right on the spot, for instance. That's not probably what would be done, but let's say that you do that. And you take the hit during the write process or just leave it as a background process, which you don't take the hit in the write. You might never see it, but it might perturb an I.O. that you're doing later. We and then don't really care as long as it's always safe on disk. So, so we suffer with that today. Uh, just simply because if there's a, 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 a write back cache, right, we don't necessarily know when data will actually hit the disk. True. Right? Yeah. So as long as after a cache flush command, we know it's everything safely on disk, I mean, we sometimes grumble about the fact that, you know, if you write a sector, you know, far off at one end of the disk and then you have lots of writes at this end of the disk, that sector that was written the far end it of the disk for might while. not make it to flatter for like, seconds, and I've heard horror stories about minutes, right? But, you know, those are the rules, right? So I think we're used to that, right? I mean, as long as cash flush does what it needs to, I don't think background matters. Because of transport funding us, the, the drive may get block N plus one before it gets block N. And it sure be nice for the block for the drive not to error out n plus one just because it hadn't seen n, if if the write cache is in use. Yeah, so I'm just trying to run through some of these as we're running out of time, and I'm 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 seeing that you know are these random write zones needed? I'm seeing feedback that yes, I'm seeing feedback that I'd like it to be more flexible than then just the beginning at the end. How many are needed is kind of tricky. I don't know that there's a number or how to do it. I've seen requests for you to be able to format it because you don't know beforehand how many of these you want to so see. One, hmm? one variant that just came in my mind when thinking about one of the file systems I work on is one thing that came in handy to make that work very well is to make sure every SMR zone has a small random zone at the beginning because that very much fits with the way that you partition a file system into multiple buckets slash allocation groups, block groups, whatever everyone calls it. So you can always have a region that has a little bit of metadata in the beginning and then a lot of data that has bigger chunk sizes after it. How much? Uh, what? How much? That's the big question. Is it 1% of the capacity, 10%, 5%? 0 0.01%? 0.01% is unlikely, yeah. And I mean, that's something we don't know, but I mean, if you look at it, over-provisioning the amount of, um, of the random zones generally causes less harm than the other way around because you can still store data that does not require the random qualities in that one, but the other way around, it's going to be really hard. Yeah, but I think, I think you're, you're thinking, Christoph, and maybe Ted, that you'd need one random zone per file system instance? You think one per allocation group? Oh, okay. So depending on how we do it, either <clears throat> we would need something like Device Mapper to take what read-write zones are available at the beginning and the end of the disk and separate it into multiple logical volumes. Uh, although then I would really worry about seek times because you know we'd have to seek pretty far to get to the random zones. I mean, I understand what Christoph is saying about it doesn't hurt to have lots of extra random write zones, except I suspect it's gonna really kill us in terms of the efficiency 
of how much data you can pack on the disk. I mean, I saw you wince a little bit when he made that suggestion, so I'm guessing. Yeah, it it's <laughs> kind of defeats the purpose. So yeah. you, you <laughs> of the other. Um, it's trickier. It, it's very tricky. I mean, it makes, there's a lot of things internal to the subsystem of the drive that are optimized when we make those decisions and sizes. And we do a lot of things in, in the, the size of data structures that we have in, internally. And uh, from our work to getting that to work, no, no, it's but a we're talking about restricted mode where you don't have to do well, all for that restricted, stuff anyway. I'm less, uh, I mean, I'm still don't like it because if I agree to you, I get killed back home. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I'm less concerned on the restricted. Uh, uh, it's more plausible. But one thing, one thing we were we were talking about. I mean, before this meeting was, Christoph was um, thinking about possibly doing uh, iSCSI target or some target device where we could emulate the, re the different restriction modes. And if we had performance reliable penalties when we broke the rules, it would be nice to actually try this out, right? And that's how we'd get you know better thought out feedback to you all. And that is possibly something we could do fairly quickly, right? That's, that, I think that's the real answer is we should yeah, try no, to model this with something we can actually run a real file system on, not just a, a model like a mathematical model, but actual code. Try to inject reasonable delays when you break the rules and give you something, give us something to, to test the XT4 XFS device uh, uh, on. On the, uh, on the density thing, on the, on the thing about how many random zones you have, uh, one thing we, that maybe we can't know, but is, I'll ask the question anyway. If I, if I ask for 10% of the capacity of the drive to be random, how much capacity did I lose compared to it all being shingled? So that's a tricky question. So you're talking about in a restricted mode, you, we can have a conversation on something like that. Because in one potential implementation, seeing as implementations are proprietary and we don't talk about them, you could have just very wide tracks. In that case, we can talk about how much you would lose. Maybe you would, let's, let's say that you, you destroy only the neighboring track. So let's say that you have half the capacity, half the error density. So you're paying a factor of two. And you say, well, a factor of two and 1%, it's 1% overhead. I'm losing 1%, and you know, that's okay, fine. I want 1%. But when you're talking about the, the host aware mode, where we're allowing for random writes in all of them. And we're doing so not by just being very you know, inefficient in right laying down separate tracks. It's not a question of capacity loss. It's a question of how much that we have to put in terms of DRAM, how much you're going to pay in terms of performance. Those are the actual questions. It's not a question of capacity, per se. And, and I think but, that's the challenging part about Chris, uh, Rick's suggestion about we could try to create a software model is that it's very easy to create a model for the dumbest possible host-aware model, which is whenever you break the rules, you have to do a read mod pi write of an entire 256 megabyte strike, right? And I could imagine that maybe there's a really cheap drive that would do that. I'm assuming many of the drives will actually have something that's more like what we have in a flash translation layer on SSDs that will do something sort of complicated. And as we all know, there's a very wide variety of mm -hmm. uh, cost uh, performance trade-offs between, say, EMMC flash and you know, the highest end you know, flash. And so it, it would be, I think, challenging for us to make a model unless we got input about what we should expect. And mm -hmm, I understand mm -hmm. that there so would probably be reticence Right. about describing what we should actually try to model. <laughs> no, no, I, that's something that we're going to take back as an action item and figure out what we, guys, we can tell you guys. I think for today, the main purpose was give you an idea of, you know, SMR is coming. This is the physical restriction that we're trying to deal with. What is the right way, what is the right abstraction to talk to the host system about it? And if the proposals or directions that we're going are completely crazy and will never work, or if there's something that we can do to make it work, and well, you, we got a lot of feedback you, you on that. We have shipping models today that pretend to be normal, unrestricted drives and have occasional performance. So I don't see the middle model being interesting, the, the host aware but not restricted, because you, you kind of do that today. If you just if you advertise enough mode page restrictions, we can kind of emulate that. We could probably avoid something. Right? We could probably be useful. 
right? But I think the restricted mode modeling that would be interesting, right? Where oh, yeah, just that, no. right? Because that's where you'd want to be, right? Uh, I assume that's your your goal, right? Is what what could we do with a restricted mode? I think the, both. I think we have. We really do believe that both will be living in the wild. To be honest, the, yeah, the host aware is the one that's more interesting for feedback because that's the one where we have to optimize and figure out how much of what we put where and what's needed versus the restricted is very simple. It's the onus is on you. And we know what we're going to do. We have no doubts as to what resources we need to put in, how we manufacture it. But the middle one is the, the one that we're, okay, you know, what is it, how is it going to be used, how much can you guys do? So, so here's... And I mean, so, yeah, I, I'd boil it down to this, right? Without getting a sense of what you get back, it's hard to justify the investment of, you know, staff years of work. Yeah, no, and right? exactly. Not but when, when you, what you get back in terms of extra density, extra performance. Oh, okay. So, so, so we need to know extra cost. Does it save one percent? Does it save ten percent of your cost and only half a percent at retail? <laughs> <laughs> Which is very likely, right? Yeah, let, let Dave answer that one. <laughs> one of the big problems here is not competitive so much as legal. Manufacturers cannot get together and tell you what we will do, right? We can work on a technical standard, but when you talk about what we will do, that's products, and the loss explicitly prohibits us colluding on products. So that, that limits what we can say about what individually we can do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we can do some things, and we can make some models, and you know, we can all go together and ask some, usually some university team to get some, some guys to make some models as to what they would do if they were to make an implementation, and people use that. You know, those type of things have been done. And, and, and then, you know, out comes the model that you guys can use. So that's something that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, especially with the host aware, I think the other issue is just that single slide that explains the host aware model still can imply like a million different versions on of, of how this is supposed to be used. It can be started yes. by just doing the trim equivalent, which we can do really easily, and it goes into all these like super fast awareness of the SMR zones, which is getting way more complicated. So the first one we can easily give you, I mean, just give us a drive that has the trim command and then we can measure it out. This is something we can Trivially, trivially do right now. The other bits are getting more and more complicated. We could do those for special purpose applications right now. And that's something I talked to you in the lunch, like when we say we want to use the XFS real-time sub-volume, which only has data on it, which has like a presetable extent size. We can't pretty easily fine-tune that for that. But that's only going to be useful for big video data streaming and similar workloads. And on the other end, if we go to the fully restricted mode, I don't think anyone would want to adopt today's general purpose file systems for it. That's something where you say, we're going to treat it as a better tape. We're going to treat it by building a special purpose object store on top of it. We use it for these kinds of like big bulk data workloads. And we could do a lot of interesting stuff with it. The big question is, if you're interested in us doing it or in the OEMs that buy gazillions of those disks for that kind of workloads. So we probably need to get a bit on, on the same page as like what's the short to medium term interest, what's the use case, and how are we working together to optimize for that particular use case. So I, I, I think that we're on the same page with what you're saying. I think the restricted, we, uh, when we discussed internally it, between amongst the, the vendors, we see it as a different device type that's going to have special purpose solutions built around them for the, those scenarios where you want the cheapest you know, possible dollars per, per gigabyte or millipennies per gigabyte. It's, and it's the more the host aware one where we are going to be having more of this interaction to see what can be done. And what you're suggesting is the trim command. And what about so the, the, the pointers and all that? Is that so for host don't even need that. A, we need trim. B, what would be really useful as a right now solution is give us an EVPD page that has as much as possible information about the SMR zones. 
And the right pointer, I mean, it can't hurt. The big question is how much overhead is it for you to actually provide it, and then no one's <laughs> going to use it. So uh, what, what I want to see, what I want to see is uh, for for us uh, to to do a very large uh, storage system. We just uh, even for a very huge uh, sequence write, we sub splice them into pieces and uh, distribute it among many servers. And yeah. uh, maybe each data block is only 64 megabyte. Yeah. Even even we. We, we write a 10 terabyte uh, data into the system for I see you typically yeah. don't don't you typically break it out and spread it yeah 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 for better horizontally over many different yeah, yeah, yeah. nodes and yeah. each one gets 64 yeah. on a large size chunk of data so in this case i'm not sure whether the the big sequential write performance is that sensitive to the application so, you, you, it, okay, I see. I mean, you, there's no reason, like we say 256 here, there's no reason that that can't be right in, in 64 and then another sequence 64 for another file. The only problem is that you have to fill it up sequentially as opposed to fill it up in right. pieces and come back and put so in the middle. It's just four of your 64 megabyte objects and the penalty is that you can't reclaim the zone until you deleted or moved all four of them, which is not perfect, but seems perfectly manageable for that sort of system that does a lot of migrations anyway, because it's probably some dynamic cluster-wide store I, that you're talking I, about. I'm going to just do a time check. We've, we've talked our way through our coffee break pretty much. <laughs> we have about five minutes uh, before the next session starts. So why don't we see, people who want to ask a couple more questions can stay, and people will be around. But if people want to get coffee, we're going to start up in about five, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes to give people a little bit of extra time, because we have to tear down at a quarter of five. <laughs>